I've always been a big fan of Catherine Mansfield, and I never knew that she had a cousin that also wrote books. Um, and I now realize that that is because she wrote in a different time period and also was kind of much less of a good writer. This book was really interesting, and it got me thinking about the various interpretations we have of our relationship with nature. I found myself drawn to the question, what is it Elizabeth sees in the garden that she values? Like, let me be clear, this book is not actually about the garden. Like, the garden is basically absent from the last third of the book. The occasionally cynical and even bizarre way that Elizabeth talks about the garden is what caught my eye, and so it's what I'm going to talk about. The first is really simple, which is that it is a way to separate herself from other people who she hates without prejudice. Like, that's probably my main takeaway from this novel, is that Elizabeth von Arman does not like anybody. <laughs> it's not just about physical separation, it's also about social separation. Early in the book, she talks about how nobody else in the area really cares about their gardens, and so by getting really invested in her, she erects this, like, barrier of unrelatability between herself and other people. Second thing is that the garden serves as a microcosm of Elizabeth's world, and the only way in which she can sort of reflect critically on the society which constricts her. She discusses her own shortcomings from the tactical perspective of what am I doing that I should change in order to have more rad flower beds, rather than how has society molded me into something which I do not like. A question that is much more loaded and difficult to bluntly address. And what enlightening things come from Elizabeth's reflection of the garden as a microcosm for her life? Well, that's the third thing, the thing that to me is the strangest thing for Elizabeth to love about her garden. Nearing the end, she imagines that by the time the babies have grown old and disagreeable, it will be very pretty here, and then possibly they won't like it, and if they have inherited the man of wrath's indifference to gardens, they will let it run wild and leave it to return to the state in which I have found it. As she goes on, it becomes clear that this possible future doesn't bother her because of its implications for the garden, but rather because it's a future in which she imagines living with her children as adults. Elizabeth goes back and forth between explaining how desperately she works to make sure each spring is an improvement upon the previous one and then dismissing the whole affair entirely. And this is nothing to say of the fact that she plants exclusively flowers rather than any plants which have, like, any intrinsic value. So in conclusion, what does Elizabeth like about the garden? That her efforts are futile, her work is ephemeral, and lacking an intrinsic value. <laughs> and of course, that by being so deeply invested in a project which is feudal, ephemeral, and lacking an intrinsic value, she can be completely separated from the cruel and restrictive social orders which surround her. So with that question answered, I want to compare Elizabeth's vision of nature to somebody else's. A lot of different people in a lot of different places have sought solace or purpose in nature, and I think it's interesting how people often have really different ideas about what it is about nature, actually, that is so great. The other perspective I want to look at is what I'll call the McCarthy-Hemingway approach, because those are the two authors who seem to receive the most over-the-top appreciation for depicting it. For those authors, nature is the universal antagonist. Interactions are between pursuer and quarry, and a person's worth can be assessed in their ability to survive within this inherently violent dynamic. Other aspects of life are either this fundamental antagonism in disguise or distorted by the hubris of human civilization. Of course, thinking about the lifestyles and interests of these two men, it really does feel like they view nature as existing so that they can go out and conquer it, and again, in doing so, prove their worth. And frankly speaking, I find this perspective to be unrealistically egocentric. McCarthy, at least according to an interview with Vanity Fair in 2005, is a man who spends his day manically learning about, like, animal life and guns, and so then he comes to the conclusion that the only objective measure of a person's worth is their ability to out-survive other entities that would otherwise best them in combat. According to the interview, McCarthy regards as not serious writers who don't address the issue of death, and that's a major bummer. <laughs> Like, what about all the parts of life that happened before death? Like, Elizabeth spends all day interacting with nature and then pouring it out on paper, dirty laundry with her husband and all, and she never approaches the issue of death. That's not an argument I find really worthy of a drawn-out facts and logic approach. I refuse to dismiss those things as meaningless, and the fact that this cynical little book has sold tons of copies in the past 120 years indicates to me that somebody finds some value in it. The McCarthy-Hemingway vision is a really masculine one, as in, besides championing virtues of masculinity over those traditionally associated with womanhood, it is also a perspective which does not seem to come naturally to women. Elizabeth von Arman doesn't see inherent antagonism, even in the dimensions of gardening which complicate and foil her plans. She sees an opportunity for indulgence, for frivolous but extrinsically rewarding expenses of effort within the context of her life as a stupidly rich, largely unfulfilled housewife. 